everybody. Greetings. Happy Constitution Day and welcome to the Suffragists and Citizenship a Dialogue discussion. I uh, want to welcome everybody to MTSU if you're one of our visitors from out of city or out of county. Welcome to Tucker Theater and to our program and to our Constitution Day celebration this year. Um, I want to start off with a public service announcement for today. Today is September 17th. This is Constitution Day um, this year and every year, September 17th. Um, if you grew up like me knowing the 4th of July as a national holiday, please add September 17th to your bank of dates to remember because it was in 2005 that Congress passed a law making sure we commemorate and teach about our tripartite form of government and the formation of the institutions that have structured our democracy for over 230 years. And the law that was passed by Congress in 2005 says that we as educational authorities of the state must make plans for the proper observance of Constitution Day and for the complete instruction of citizens in their responsibilities and opportunities as citizens of the United States. So I'm not sure if today we're going to be able to provide complete instruction, but please do take a free copy of the US Constitution that is in the lobby. Read it, reread it, uh, it'll make you proud and it will inform you what you need in terms of working on moving forward with the type of uh, government that we're forming a more perfect union. The um, law that we must make plans says that we must make plans for Constitution Day and make plans we have done. We started Constitution Week yesterday here in this auditorium with Vice President Al Gore and Cambridge University President, uh, excuse me, Professor Anthony Badger discussing citizenship in light of Senator Albert Gore Sr.'s and Vice President Al Gore's experiences developing policy for Tennessee and the nation. And today, we're bringing you the Murfreesboro, Rutherford County, and Middle Tennessee State University kickoff of a celebratory year of studying and thinking about and talking about and generating civic energy from the 19th Amendment, which secured the vote for women in this nation and which finally, at long last, gave the other 50% of this country's people true citizenship and not until 1920 in the history of this country. So our purpose today is to look at the suffragists who worked ardently for respect and for legal equality and the right to vote in the United States, which says that we are ruled by the consent of the governed, but the consent requires that we access the ballot in order to provide our consent. And to ask, given voter disfranchisement today and laws passed that make voting more restrictive rather than more widely accessible to our citizens, and with widespread purging from the voter rolls and ID laws that require cash outlay and payment for a driver's license or passport, um, restrictions and limitations limit the numbers of folks who can provide their consent by going to the ballot. Help me understand why um, charging and paying fees for these additional pieces of identification are not some violation of the Constitution's 24th Amendment that prohibits any form of poll tax. But before we get to our program, I have housekeeping notes. These are more public service announcements to share. There are books in the lobby by our guests, our speakers. They're available for purchase at the bookstore table, uh, which will still be open at the end of this program. And we invite you to take advantage of that and go out into the lobby, purchase a book, and bring that book down to this stage where there will be a reception and a visitation with our panelists and we'll open the curtains and people can come down and meet them and take selfies and have an opportunity to uh, welcome them personally to MTSU. And also there is voter registration out on the Tucker lawn out in front of the building. Compliments of the Murfreesboro and Rutherford County League of Women Voters and we appreciate so much their coming. Um, I want to admonish everybody to please go register and to check your registration. If you think you are registered, go to Tennessee Voter Lookup on your phones or your laptops, Tennessee Voter Lookup, and check and be sure that you're registered. I wanna make a point too, to live here, vote here. That is to say, studies and data tell us 
that people actually vote if they are registered where they live, where they sleep at night, where they park their car, where they put their shoes under the bed. We want you to register, and you must get registered, and we want you to also vote. So please vote in a practical way where you can get to the polls that you need to be. Um, also in the Civic Responsibilities Department, 2020 is going to be the United States National Census, and that commences this spring. And the Rutherford County Census Office has a table out in the front, and they have asked me to tell you that they would ask that every one of us do our civic responsibility come spring and respond to those census questionnaires to have ourselves counted, be enumerated, as the Constitution says. And also, they invite you to apply online to come to work for them because they need a lot of bodies to help assist the 2020 U.S. Census. And the way to get to that, um, they're serious about that. They'd love for you to come work for them. So it's a part-time jobs that could fit with your schedules at work, potentially. 2020census.gov forward slash jobs. 2020census.gov forward slash jobs. So as we proceed to our program, I would very much like to thank our sponsors today. Certainly want to thank the College of Liberal Arts and the University Honors College and the Office of the University Provost um, and the MTSU Distinguished Lecture Fund and the Albert Gore Senior Research Center and um, my own program, the American Democracy Project for Civic Learning. And I want most especially to thank the Center for Historic Preservation and the Tennessee Civil War National Heritage Area, um, the director of the Tennessee Center and the MTSU Center for Historic Preservation and our Tennessee State Historian is Dr. Van West. And I am going to introduce him to introduce our speakers to you today. Dr. West. Good afternoon, Blue Raider Nation. You don't know how good it, do it feels to stand up for a change. And I'm glad to stand up for this program today. Not many times in Tennessee history do what, what happens here affects the nation as profoundly as August 1920, when the Tennessee General Assembly approved the suffrage amendment, giving women the right to vote. It was a profound moment in Tennessee history that still reverberates today. And thank you for joining us for this both commemoration of those events, but also a dialogue about what those events mean today. And I've been real pleased to watch the different folks fill in. Of course, the Blue Raider Nation is coming out. Thank you for being here. I'm seeing colleagues from Vanderbilt, University of South Carolina, Austin P. State University, um, Volunteer State Community College. And I want to thank them for coming out because the issues we're talking about now and the issues our panelists will address are truly important. And I think they gain importance every day of the year. Our speakers, let me just briefly introduce them because they have a lot to say and I want to hear what they have to say. But being state historian, it gives me a particular great honor to, rep to recognize and welcome Representative London Lamar, who's from the 91st District, and that's in Memphis. Representative Lamar, for those of you who maybe don't read Memphis newspapers daily, as some of us do, she is part of a group of young African-American women that are starting to reshape the, the politics, the history, and the sense of opportunity and citizenship in the Bluff City. It's one of the most encouraging developments that I am witnessing across the state. And it's one that we all need to pay attention to and learn to support and adopt. She is one of these representatives, and we need more of them, who will reach across the aisle, work with whatever party is in power, to achieve good things, positive change for her constituents. This was once a great philosophy in Tennessee government. It can once, have been, uh, once again be a philosophy in Tennessee government under the leadership of people like Representative Lamar. It also gives me great pleasure to welcome here to Middle Tennessee State University an old colleague and friend of mine, Marjorie Spurl. 
Marjorie was, her research on Southern women's history and particularly the suffrage movement has been pathbreaking throughout her career. When we were preparing for the 75th anniversary of the suffrage amendment, she, her book, Votes for Women, was crucial to understanding what that meant and what we should explore. Her work was crucial in my own Tennessee Encyclopedia of History and Culture of making women's suffrage and the stories of the different suffragettes a major part of that research volume. And just like 25 years ago, today her new book, Divided We Stand, The Battle Over Women's Rights and Family Values, is shaping our dialogues as we look at the centennial of the women's suffrage movement and what that means. And what I have taken away from all of her work is, it's all about steps. Steps that abolitionists made many years ago, steps that women like Ida B. Wells, Mary Church Terrell, both from Memphis, made for the state and the nation, and the steps of people like Viola McFerrin in Fayette County, and Diane Nash in Nashville in the late 1950s and 60s. This is all about steps forward, and we have more steps forward to take. And that brings us to Margaret Rinkel. She lives in Nashville. I'm glad she does, because she writes for prestigious magazines and newspapers, and sometimes that helps to get the word out about what's going on in Tennessee. Her most recent book is Late Migrations, A Natural History of Love and Loss. But I have to admit, I love her columns. And I also really respect the fact that she is the founding editor of Chapter 16, a daily literary publication of Humanities Tennessee. That's our statewide Humanities Council. And they were at the very beginning of saying, we have to do something about the women suffrage centennial. Let's get this going. And they've been a crucial organization in that. So you have a delight before you. Three knowledgeable people coming from different walks of life, different places in our nation, but they're all about where are we going as a people? Where are we going to build the better democracy? that we all have earned and we deserve. So I'll turn it over to the panelists. I want to thank on behalf of the panel, Dr. Evans and the American Democracy Project and Middle Tennessee State University for um, convening this panel because, I'm not really sure what's happening. Oh, because, um, <laughs> The, it's only been, we've been, we've, women have had the right to vote for only 100 years, which seems astonishing on, on its very surface. How could that be? How could it be only 100 years? And yet, how much have we forgotten in that time? How few people know the story of the struggle to pass the 19th century amendment, a 19th amendment, and how few people understand even today the, I want to choose my words carefully, the efforts to make sure that only some people vote, even now. So that's what our goal is today. How do we tie the past, so much of which is now forgotten, to the present, so much of which is not understood. And so I'm going to start by basically asking our two panelists to lay some groundwork for us. Dr. Spruill, can you, um, just for the sake of people who might not know the story, can you just tell us the story of the 19th century, the, I don't know why I keep saying that, of the 19th Amendment. Tell us how it, the, give us uh, some background about the the historical moment in which this struggle began and came to fruition. Okay. Um, nice to see everybody. Uh, Margaret has just asked me to do something that <laughs> no, it's uh, impossible. Is, is, uh, I can take either you know an hour, three days, three weeks to do this, <laughs> but I'm going to give it you this really skinny version. 
And um, in the interest of the fact that we've got so much to talk about, um, the women's suffrage movement in the United States is usually said to have begun in 1848. There were a few people who spoke in favor of women's rights before that, but that marked the, 18, the Seneca Falls Convention where uh, people got together and they passed a declaration of sentiments in which they outlined all the many things, injustices against women that they thought needed to be fixed. At that time, the idea of a vote was thought to be such an outrageous, radical proposition that most, that, that was the only thing controversial. But Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Frederick Douglass, who were both there and spoke eloquently on how important the vote is, carried the day. And so it became part of the demands of the women's rights movement. And right after the Civil War, the women's rights advocates began to think more and more that the vote was key. And as you know, during Reconstruction, um, the 14th and 15th Amendments were passed uh, dealing with the issues of citizenship and who could vote. And um, in the discussion, uh, what happened was that African American men, their citizenship was recognized, the vote was extended to them, but it was, women were left out largely because the Republicans in Congress felt that it was um, imperative that newly freed individuals have the power to protect themselves and, and also that their party have votes in the South. And so women were asked to wait and this, be patient. Uh, your hour, this is the Negro's hour, they said, your hour will come. After that was, um, the reaction to that uh, just divided the women's rights advocates into two, two groups who, uh, all of them, black and white, radical and not, were upset about this, but one group uh, affiliated with Lucy Stone and the American Women's Suffrage Association said, we've got to support this no matter uh, what. Uh, and Stanton and Anthony uh, rather famously refused to support it. Now, mind you, they wanted the right, they wanted universal suffrage for all, and, but they refused to work for Negro suffrage uh, if the women were left out. After that, they tried to get a woman suffrage amendment to the Constitution uh, since they had been left out of the 15th. Uh, they also tried other approaches, going to the Supreme Court, uh, trying to appeal under the 14th Amendment that as citizens, they ought to have the right to vote. But the Supreme Court in um, Minor v. Happerstadt in 1875 said, uh, no, that in your case, it's going to have to be up to the states. So that was a supremely important turning point in the history of the women's suffrage movement because that meant that you know, they were not going to get a quick and easy solution through federal uh, government anytime soon, and they had to go to the states. And so that set off years and years and years of uh, going out and pleading with led voters and legislators all over the country to get women the right to vote. Um, to move a little faster, uh, <laughs> they began to realize that in order that, that ultimately the goal was going to be a national amendment. But as you know, I'm sure, uh, in this day that we celebrate the Constitution, um, the Founding Fathers meant for the Constitution to be able to be amended, but they didn't want that to happen lightly, frequently, or without a massive consensus. So they put in that you had to have two-thirds of each House of Congress to get an amendment through Congress, and then it had to be ratified by three-fourths of the states. And so in order to do that, they had to have a national grounded movement. They had to have support all over the state. And as I used to say to my students all the time, somehow a movement that had started in the Northeast uh, as perceived as radical offshoot of the anti-slavery movement, somehow had to become a national movement that was not regarded as radical, but accepted by the majority of Americans. And so 
the story of how they got from one point to the other point is long and obviously the meat of the story. Um, but finally, um, they ended up um, in 1919 getting it through Congress and then it was submitted to the states. And at first they were scrambling to be the ones to ratify. But in the South, it was another question, another issue for uh, reasons that we might get into a little bit later, largely having to do with race and states' rights. Uh, the South was the part of the country that was the most hostile to the movement, where the movement came last, where it ran into the most opposition, and where it had the least success. Uh, and so finally, in the end, Southern suffragists uh, were only able to get four Southern states to, to ratify. Uh, and it was just really miraculous and the, the result of a great deal of work and effort. And still, it looked like this wasn't going to happen, but Tennessee came through and saved the day. And so therefore, this state needs to be uh, celebrated. Representative Lamar, I'm, we're going to segue a little bit because we had, uh, we had the history of women in this country. I'd like to know a little bit about your history. What inspired you? I don't know in the introductions if uh, you've heard that Representative Lamar is the youngest member of the Tennessee General Assembly. What inspired you to run for office last year? What about your childhood or your upbringing led you to see really surrendering so much of your private life to public service as a thing you wanted to do, This, especially right now as a young woman. Absolutely. First and foremost, I want to thank Middle Tennessee State University, the American Democracy Project, Professor Evans for inviting me to share my story with you today. I'm just a couple of years out of college myself. Um, but I started off as a young girl. My mother was one of those type of moms who was very interested in what was going on in the community surrounding her. So I was always, I remember homework time would be four o'clock Oprah, five o'clock news. And so I became very socially conscious <laughs> at a young age. And um, she had me in every type of program, volunteer opportunity. So the idea of service and giving back to my community was something that manifested in me at a young age. And I didn't realize the impact it would have on me here at 28 years old. And so um, my, I re always remember being in high school, student council this and, you know, this club and just being very involved. But I never really thought that running for office was something that was possible for a girl that looked like me, a young African-American woman um, who you didn't see a lot of women in political positions making decisions. But that day, I'll never forget that November 28, uh, 2008, uh, my senior year of high school, President Barack Obama was elected the 44th president of the United States. And that was a very life-changing moment for me because I said, wow, a man who looks like me made it to the highest office of the land. I too can pursue politics. And so I went to college like many of you here today and I began getting involved in my college community. I started a college Democrats club at my University of St. Mary's College, Notre Dame, Indiana. And my college was very, it was Catholic, conservative, kind of opposite of the many of the views that I believed, but I felt that it cultivated a community where regardless of what your background was, they pushed us women to get involved and be vocal. And I went to all women's university. And so I took that same activism after I graduated college and moved back to Memphis. And when I got involved, I was 23 years old, just recently graduated from college, trying to get, you know, figure out what I'm going to do. And I went to a local Democratic Party meeting and I noticed I was the only young person there, the only young person there. And these were influencers in my community making decisions about what our city was supposed to look like and what the politics was supposed to, how it's supposed to be shaped. And so I said, hey, I want to get involved. What can I do? And what they directed me to do was sit, work the sign-in table. You can be a volunteer. That's, that's what we want you to do. And of course, I didn't mind because those positions are important. However, I wanted a seat at the decision-making table, especially knowing that my generation was the largest rising generation of eligible voters in this country. I felt that it was important that our voice should be at the table. So I got sick of beg begging and brought a folding chair. 
So I started <laughs> the Shelby County Young Democrats at 23 years old. It was a chapter of uh, the Greater Young Democrats organization. Um, that w was dead for a couple of years. And so I uh, brought it back to life. And you know, I, that's just my particular political party. I mean, I was just more so concerned in the overarching goal of young people being engaged in a political process. But I um, started this organization and then I ran for office for a position on the state party. And I did this all in 2014 and I lost my first election. I ran for office and I lost. But I was something for me was determined. I was like, okay, we're making a way for young people. This organization became the most active chapter in a year in our state uh, organization. I said, okay, we can't stop. And so I decided to really dedicate my life to the idea of public service and civic engagement. Alongside getting involved in particular issues that were very important to my community, such as working in education advocacy and reproductive justice, because as a woman, I felt that it's two of the biggest issues concerning our livelihood was what type of education system we want our children to grow up in, especially now being an expecting mother. You know, I wanted to be able to shape the education system my son will one day grow up in and also have complete autonomy on how to make decisions around my body. And from there, I became the president of the Tennessee Young Democrats for four years and was able to take that mission statewide across Tennessee to engage young people across the state in the political process. Because what I was sick of us was doing was saying, hey, you know, I want to see this happen. I want to see this happen. I want to see my community look like this, but we are not at the decision making table. And oftentimes it's because we didn't have an apparatus or organization to give us the leverage to amplify the voices and be a part of the process that we were complaining about. And so from then on, when I was an open seat that opened up in my district last year, I was always interested in state politics. There are probably less than 10 women in the state house and only three black women. And I said, well, it's time for me to run. And I decided to run for office. Um, I ran against three other women, um, two other women, excuse me. And I won with 47% of the vote. Um, and I ran not because of the particular issues facing District 91, which was poverty, um, which was lack of education, uh, health care needs. And those were the issues that I knew that I had to be grounded in, which is what I centered my career life on being an expert in those particular issues. But also, most important thing that people need to see is true representation. Mm -hmm. And that is what I wanted to bring to the table here in Tennessee. And being the youngest uh, legislator currently in the Tennessee General Assembly, Sometimes I feel like I'm representing a whole generation, and that's not the goal. The, but the goal is to feel like young people have a voice in the political process. And I understand that, to me, the modern-day suffrage movement is not only a continuing to expand the uh, women's access to voting, but also another gener a demographic of people, which is young people, also feel slighted by the system. And I want to make sure that my role in the Tennessee General Assembly is to, sure, is to ensure that our laws are supporting young people's ability to take part in the political process and hopefully my run for office will inspire more young people to run for office because I shouldn't be the only one there. I need a whole squad of other young people <laughs> to help me as well. Dr. Sproul, let's jump off on um, Representative Lamar's personal experience and, and, and backtrack to the, tell us a little bit about um, uh, Alice Paul and some of the, uh, and the National uh, Women's Party. I think um, that party was made up of primarily younger women, more, mm -hmm. um, let's say, I don't wanna say radical, that has a bad connotation, but you know what I'm saying, mm -hmm. women who were less patient. <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's a good way to put it, yes. <laughs> um, it, it certainly had young women leading it. Uh, they had a range of uh, ages in it, uh, such as Alva Vanderbilt Belmont, who funded it largely, who was quite up there in age. But you're right, the, a lot of young, really kind of hip young women uh, were into it. And if any of you have ever seen or not seen the HBO show Iron Jawed Angels, uh, I would really recommend that to you. 
because Hollywood made these women look really hip. And it uh, does a lot for the image of the movement, really. Uh, when you have Hilary Swank, you know, starring as Alice Paul and Dr. McDreamy as her main love interest, and, uh, and it just goes on from there. Um, Alice Paul comes back in 1910 from Britain, where she had been studying. She was a, uh, in graduate school in political science and eventually got a PhD. And while she was over there, she was hanging out with the more militant wing of the suffrage movement in Britain. And let me take this moment to point out that in Britain, there were two, like in this country, there were two wings. There was the larger, older, moderate uh, branch uh, that were called suffragists. And then there was this younger branch headed by Emmeline Pankers that was much more radical. And then when the press called them suffragettes, they embraced the term. So they are accurately called uh, suffragettes, but not any of our suffragists are called suffragettes. They were only called that as a slur by their detractors. So I'm hoping to make it through 2020 and convince everyone uh, <laughs> not to use the term suffragettes. But anyway, so she comes back and she finds that the National American Woman Suffrage Association has lots of money in its budget for pushing for the completion of this long journey, for getting that federal amendment. But yet all of their work had been still caught up in this state-by-state -state organizing. And she's thinking, let's get with it. Let's quit that. We, we're, you've got a lot of states now. Let's you know, just go for the federal amendment. And um, so she convinced them to let her bring in some of the tactics from, uh, from Britain, including these dramatic parades. Uh, although she rejected a lot of the tactics uh, that were used by the British militants because Alice Paul didn't believe in violence. She thought it was bad for the image and she was a, personally was a Quaker. So all of the rock throwing and bomb tossing and stuff like that that the British suffragettes were involved in she rejected, and that was never a part of the militant branch of woman suffrage. But the, their, they were determined to move this thing forward. Uh, it, it distressed them no end that Susan B. Anthony, who had been such a champion of this movement for so many years that she had even voted in defiance of the law and, and being, was arrested for knowingly in violation of the law, voting for a member of Congress of the United States, that was the rap on her, she was ar arrested and hoped to take her case to the Supreme Court. They hated to see that she had gone through all that she had gone through and then died before it came to fruition. And they're going, in her memory and in her honor, we're gonna wrap this thing up. So uh, they began pressing uh, for women's suffrage using newer and more radical methods. I don't know how many of you know that uh, civil disobedience uh, and picketing the White House for political cause, that was initiated by the suffragists. No other group uh, had engaged in that before them. We associate it more le with the later civil rights movement, but uh, they had been uh, doing this. They picketed the White House, they stood out there in all kinds of weather. Uh, they did this for so many months that the press started to call them the Iron Jawed Angels, and that's why that call that film that. Eventually, uh, war broke out, and uh, they decided they were not going to support it. And not only that, they were gonna keep on picketing the White House despite the fact that the war was going on. And that infuriated the Wilson administration, infuriated the public, um, we had laws against that kind of thing during uh, World War I. And um, so crowds came and beat them up and, uh, and the police stood by and eventually the, the police arrested them, put them in paddy wagons, took them off to Occoquan and they beat them up too. And so this went on for quite a long time and, it, it, and what ended up happening got a lot of press for, for the suffrage cause. Uh, in, uh, and when it 
one of their parades when they had 8,000 people vote, going down Pennsylvania Avenue and the crowd charged them, pelted them with lit cigarettes and uh, liquor bottles and then you know, beat them up. The fact that a lot of women who were wives of members of Congress were in their line uh, had, uh, had a lot to do with it. So Alice Paul uh, was a woman in a hurry. She, she was, had all these young, cool women who were in a hurry. Uh, and they, um, they had a lot of courage and grit, even went on hunger strikes. Uh, and eventually, that really helped the cause. Historians debate over how much it helped versus how much it hurt, because the radicalism did alienate a lot of people, certainly pissed off Woodrow Wilson big time. Uh, but they uh, ended up, uh, I believe, the combination of their media savvy and courage and the attention that it brought along with the patient, plotting, careful legislative lobbying of the more moderate brand led by Kerry Chapman Hatt. I think it took both things and that they complemented each other very nicely and that all of it contributed to the victory. Um, Representative Lamar, people aren't generally throwing rocks and taking uh, women in to uh, beat them up in um, police stations, not generally, um, although we, I guess, know it happens. But, but in the age of social media, women, female candidates take a beating even so. Mm -hmm. And, um, and it's, uh, uh, I mean, you have to have an immense amount of courage and an immense amount of um, persistence to, uh, to deal with the kind of hatred that comes across Twitter or that comes across um, some of these uh, podcasts and radio programs. And yet, you are the youngest, uh, the, the youngest state legislator in Tennessee, but we are seeing more and more younger people, and, and, and especially women, and especially women of color, who are stepping forward in spite of all of these suppressive tactics to find their political voices in one form or another. What do you think is inspiring that? Well, I'll say one thing, when women run, women win. Um, and that is something that I have seen not only in the city of Memphis with so many African-American women winning their races, but as you can see across the nation. What I think is inspiring women is one, a couple of economic factors. Now women are 50% of the workplace now. More and more women are uh, the breadwinners in their homes. They're the decision makers in their homes, yet they feel like how um, our society is um, constructed doesn't um, help their ability to move forward economically. Um, so that's one thing. I think that women are tired of being, voices not being taken seriously. And I think at this point, what was pivotal for a lot of women was the ready to see a woman in leadership like Hillary Clinton and to see that being snubbed from her. And so more women are being inspired to step up into leadership and run. And I think as our influence grows in our economy and in our communities, then you will see more and more women run for office. And I think that at this point, because of the suffrage movement and where we are 100 years later and our, uh, increasing <coughs> women's ability to take part in the political process, you see more women comfortable enough to run. And you see more women supporting more women in their run for office. And so I am just really excited to see that. And I think that um, with social media, women are able to get their platform, their voices out there in a way they weren't able to do before. Uh, I know I've taken my fair share of beatings on social media. I remember I started a session um, with being beat down by a Facebook video that I made talking about some of the issues in my community that may not um, be what particular members of my, my colleagues want to hear. Um, and I think that women um, are used to being criticized. You know, if, if it's not from our hair and our nails and how we raise our children and how we show up in the workplace or what heels we have on to what particular issues we are allowed to speak on or what particular issues we are able to condone or support, 
we're always being criticized. This world is so critical of women. So for us, we already come with a certain level of strength and understanding that as a woman, I'm always constantly facing adversity. And so I think that is what motivates us to get more involved in the political process. It definitely motivates me. You know, so Join the Truth said, ain't I a woman? And that was just so powerful because she talks about the trials and tribulations we have to go through. And I think that, you know, we understand that if we don't get involved, that then the circumstances for us won't change. Um, but, you know, I think social media has also allowed women to be able to gain support outside of the inner circle. You know, mm -hmm. a lot of times we have to ask for permission to run or be involved. And no, we no longer have to ask for permission. If my family members or my political leaders in my local area don't want to support my run, I can get my voice out there via some tweets, social media, Instagram, and have all these other women around the country support me. You know, I've had um, individuals and women from California, New York, Florida, all around the country donate to my campaign, support my run for office, even though they don't live in the city of Memphis where I wasn't able to find a lot of support locally. And I've had to earn that support, but it's just great that I was able to amplify my voices through this form of media that women didn't have back in the day when we started the, the suffrage movement. And so it's giving women a greater platform that their ability to do what they wanted to do is not limited, but it's oftentimes being able to be a global uh, conversation that we haven't been able to have in the past. Let's go back to the past for a minute and talk, if Dr. Sproul, if you will, about the women who did not support suffrage. The women who, um, not just in Tennessee, but also in Tennessee, in the nation, um, what, help us understand what possible motivation a woman would have for suppressing another woman's right to vote? Good. That's a very good question. Uh, but certainly back at the time of the suffrage movement, the vast majority of women uh, did not work to support the suffrage movement. Um, and but what, what was their thinking? What's, what's, it's they, so hard for me to yeah. wrap my mind around that whole idea. Well, they, they were, uh, comfortable with the world right. it, that was separated into men's activities and women's activities, the spheres idea, and they were, had been brought up to believe that women and men were profoundly different from one another uh, and that the divinely created differences in the sexes fitted them for different roles in society and also that, you know, w women were the civilizing force. The, the suffrage rhetoric, the anti-suffrage rhetoric was full of this. They were the anchor to windward. They were the, um, you know, the, the, the ones who would keep, there were all these analogies to ancient Rome and how the fall of civilization started to happen, you know, when women got outside their place. Um, the people said that, well, this is going to change women. They're going to, uh, not be content anymore with the domestic sphere. They are, husbands are going to have to take care of children for God's sake, you know, uh, you know horrible things like that. And they, they, uh, they also um, expressed concern that politics was such a, a rotten, corrupting thing. Uh, I don't know if you know, but back then, um, a lot of polling places were in saloons or livery stables and places where men gathered that women were not allowed and, and no decent woman would go. And, and also, as you may recall, that in the period where this movement was going on in the South, politics was a violent game, a nasty, ugly game that included uh, efforts by uh, white Southern conservatives to restore white political supremacy by any means that they, could, that they thought necessary. They felt justified. They thought it was so profoundly important to counter the effects of the 15th Amendment, which they believed had been forced upon them in a hostage situation but when Congress wouldn't let them back into the Union without uh, agreeing to it. So they felt justified in doing anything to uh, either keep black men from voting or to counter the effects of it. 
Um, and so they used women as the muse. They justified taking the vote away from men by saying, we protect white women, and that's our main goal in life, and uh, all this. So the women were put into this, this situation where um, they felt like that their role in politics was to inspire. Um, now, one thing, however, that I should say is that it's not true that the women who opposed women's suffrage uh, just did not want women involved in public life in any way. Um, a lot of them, however, were women who believed that they could accomplish their goals through indirect influence, that men would listen to them and that they could be the power behind the throne. Um, and so that was the key difference between the suffragists and the anti-suffragists uh, is is this, the suffragists were not going around saying woman suffrage is going to uh, change, change women, we're going to get better, we're gonna get stronger, we're gonna take over the world. They weren't saying that uh, because that would have been counterproductive. So the main difference between them was uh, the suffragists saying, we are tired of trying to get an end to child labor, uh, better working conditions, public health, better education, and into corruption, um, and nobody's listening to us in comparison to the way they're listening to industries. But the, the conservative women were saying, uh, we are being listened to, and the world would be worse, not better, if woman suffrage happened. Can I piggyback off that? Well, actually, I have a question for you on the very same subject. Um, because you talked um, about uh, reproductive autonomy, and uh, which I know what you mean by that, but I think you should explain what you mean by that, but also why we see women, conservative women today, voting against that and other questions, our 21st century version of influence outside the sphere of the home. That's a great question, which is why I was going to piggyback off what she was saying. And some of those same issues you see today, um, I remember being told, well, if you run for office and you're this outspoken woman, you're not going to find a husband. <laughs> well, don't no man want a wife more powerful than him? Or Hillary messing it up for us housewives. You know, I want to be a stay-at-home mom. You know, the more women in the workforce, the less men to have jobs to take care of us. And so when I hear conversations like that, it is, you know, a lot of women don't support the ability for more women to be um, more autonomous in their lives because it's messing up their ability to be comfortable in what they're doing. And now I'm not knocking housewives. Sometimes I want to be a housewife too. You know, sit up, drink lemonade, take care of some kids, keep it moving. You're gonna but be in such trouble. Bake cookies, <laughs> bake cookies. <laughs> bake cookies. You know, because it, it yeah. is hard doing the work that we're doing. However, however, I think that oftentimes the way our society is is shaped, women need the ability to make more decisions about their lives. So, for example. The reason why so many women are fighting to be in office is because you have, for example, my legislature, which is overwhelmingly men, making decisions about how I'm supposed to dictate when I'm going to start my family or how I'm supposed to use my body. Now, I don't know about you, but there's no one type of woman and one type of way she, she, her body operates. So there is no one way that, you know, we need to be dictating how she's supposed to live. That is just an example of why so many women fight for autonomy in this world, because you have people who don't understand our livelihood, what we're going through, making the decisions. And be more women being in office doesn't take away from the women and their comfortability and, and, and what they want to do and what they're used to, but you're also hindering us from us being able to live the lives that we want to. And so because, you know, oftentimes you see conservative women and women like myself often clash is because how we see the world operates is completely different. We can't get on the same page. And it's also our upbringings. I come from a single parent household. I've had a job since I was 16 years old. 
I don't know what it's like to sit and drink tea all day or have a privileged lifestyle. So of course, I'm going to fight for more fairness in the workplace. I'm going to fight for reproductive autonomy. I'm going to fight for healthcare needs because that's something I need to survive. I can't understand what your life is like. And I'm not trying to take away from that, but don't try to take away from mine. And so oftentimes we're able to get on the same page a lot about when it comes to education needs and, you know, fighting for children and things like that. But what I don't appreciate is those women trying to take away from other women who are trying to push, uh, push our agenda forward. And so that's oftentimes, it's not just an issue that we had in the 1920s and uh, prior to, that's an issue that's going on today as you see in the modern day feminist movement, um, w just like Trump. You know, he's talking about grabbing whatever and this and this and that, but you know, over 50% of white women still voted for him because of whatever issues, other issues they cared to, to, to take away. I particularly didn't vote for him because I feel like economically he wasn't going to benefit me. And but I don't, you know, you know, talk about or or uh, put down those women who voted for him. But there's oftentimes women we can't get on the same page about how we want to live our lifestyles and that's just an ongoing battle that we're oftentimes going to have to continue to fight through um, and so i think that it's just important that women we respect each other's place and how we want to move forth in the world um, but it hasn't stopped and it's still a hundred years later a big issue for us it is um and then there's another big issue that we want to talk about too and and could you talk dr sproul about the role racism played in uh, the whole question of suffrage, mm -hmm. um, the 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 well, I just want to leave it at that. Okay. Another Tell big, us about that. Another huge subject. Um, <laughs> in and, and, in and, and a thousand words or less. Okay. <laughs> it played a really important role. Um, it's almost as if when you look at the history of the struggle for the rights of African Americans and the struggle for the rights of women, uh, as if um, the, the powers that be would almost put them at odds with each other in order to uh, keep them both down or something. But it's, they've been, uh, one of the most important things to, about this, one of the most basic things about this is that um, when the 15th Amendment was being drafted um, Frederick Douglass and others believed, as I said earlier, that they would not be able to get it ratified uh, if they included the, the radical idea of woman's suffrage and that it was just so important you know, for African Americans to have this vote to protect themselves um, that they, white women, you know, not white women, because it's all women, all women, just had to understand. And black women, were mad about that at the time, and white women were mad about that at the time. But as I said, they divided about what to do about it. But main point being that um, it was decided in order to be able to get that amendment through. Okay. Um, when it came the 15th, to the fifteenth, you're still fifteenth. When it came to the nineteenth, things were reversed. The uh, the. the uh, Northern Republican Party you know, had stopped supporting black suffrage. Um, the, the white South, Southern politicians had largely stripped African Americans, men of the vote, and uh, the Supreme Court had stood by or actually helped them uh, mm -hmm. with rulings that helped them do it. Um, and if, if you were, a white person or a black person in the South during that time and stood up for black suffrage, it was dangerous and downright risky uh, for life and limb. And, and, you're, and definitely when the suffragists were working to gain the support of the likes of Pitchfork, Gwen Tillman and other Southern congressmen who would have to vote on this as they tried to get two thirds of the house in each one, um, they would never have gotten it. Uh, Suzanne Lebsack, a uh, great historian, once said of Virginia suffragists um, that if they had declared themselves 
this is the white suffragists, if they had declared themselves solidly in favor of black suffrage and come up for it, they might as well have folded their tents and gone home, okay? On the other hand, you know, we look back on it today and very, very critical of the white suffragist. Um, we're obviously critical of the ones who had horrible things to say about black people and said, you know, they're like another species, they're never gonna get better, they're gonna die out in the fight for competition. Some of these Southern suffragists said things like that. But a, uh, but a lot of them, um, particularly in the last years, were saying, uh, we are gonna try to separate these issues because it's important to get this thing through. Hope you understand. So in a way, you see a reversal yeah. of these two things. And it's not pretty in either case. Mm -hmm. It's not pretty in either case. Um, at the same time, it's, the other aspect was that, um, the, again, they had to have the two-thirds in each house and they had to get it ratified. And so the, it, they had to, to tread extremely carefully knowing that anything they said about race was going to be grabbed by the antis and used against them. And if you think anything that was said by the suffragists on race sounds bad, you should see the things that the antis were saying. Mm -hmm. And the brochures, in, in the book I uh, published that Van mentioned, uh, Votes for Women, the Woman Suffrage Movement in Tennessee, the South, and the Nation, uh, one ho whole section of it is anti-suffrage broadsides, political cartoons, and literature. Look at that, because you, you get an idea of, of the extremes that they were going to and the viciousness uh, of the ways that they used it. And so largely what white suffragists were doing in the South in the last uh, 10 years was saying, these are separate issues and, and this is ugly, the, and whatever laws applied to black men are also gonna apply to black women. The ugliest part was that after they got the vote in 1920, they still didn't help them. Right. And that's where I'm not defending them at all. <laughs> you know, that's, uh, that it was extremely disappointing. Uh, to African-American women who had been told along, we can't help you because the, we're, we're trying to get this thing through and in the end it'll benefit you and it'll benefit us. Um, now when black women tried to register to vote in the South and were turned away, uh, they went before the, the Women's Party they, and asked for help and, and again, Alice Paul said, this is a single issue, we're only about women's rights and we're not gonna help you. So, you know, it's a very complicated story. You can look, hit this from lots of years. Um, but, it, but it's something as we look back on it, um, it's important to try to understand the context um, and that we learn a little bit about race relations in our country and race relations in politics from looking back at, at the past. Um, that's all I got to say we're, about We're 100 that. years on now, mm -hmm. and represent a little more. I want to talk to you about your inaugural uh, session of the Tennessee General Assembly, because it, um, Tennessee has among the lowest voter turnout in the country, and that is, it turns out, not by accident. So I hope that you can talk a little bit about institutional racism in our laws here, in our voting laws here in Tennessee, and, um, and how it played out in this year's uh, legislative session, and, and really where you think we're going now. I always have to sigh when I think about the state of our legislature in 2019. Um, just to piggyback off, I think African-American women are still fighting for equality in this system. We make 68 cents to the dollar compared to white men. Um, you know, when it comes to the women's suffrage movement, we were at the back of the marches, you know. Even when it That's passed, right. we still got turned away. We were charged poll taxes. You know, the Voting Rights Act had to put in place in order to bring more equality to the idea of you know, fairness in, in the political process. And even to this day, black women are oftentimes the most discriminated upon 
demographic of people in this country. And I feel it every day, even as one of three black women in the state house and the youngest by 30 years. And how even my colleagues talk to me, how they, t you know, how serious they take my legislation. Um, and so when I think about black women oftentimes fighting for the right to vote, we are still fighting for equality today. So I don't know if many of you've heard that there was a group um, based out of Nashville and did work across the state called the Equity Alliance. And they worked with a national PAC to register tens of thousands of African Americans to vote in this past 2018 election. Most, many of those were in the city of Memphis, my city of Memphis, which is predominantly African American. We, we had record numbers of African American young people, women, who turned out to vote. And we were able to get fair representation, like myself and other black African Americans elected to office in our city, which is predominantly African American. As a result, the Secretary of State of Tennessee and individuals um, leading the election subcommittee and in our state passed a bill that will criminalize voter registration because of what happened in our 2018 election. And it's oftentimes cited the record number of uh, applicants we had registered and turned out to vote in Memphis. So all of a sudden, you pass one of the most egregious and most harsh penalties on voter registration in the country as a result of more black people getting involved in the political process outside of Memphis, in Memphis Tennessee, and across the state of Tennessee. And it passed. Can you give an example of what would get someone, we're talking about jail time. Jail time, so the bill, what the bill said was, if an organization turns in over 100 incomplete forms, that was a, symbol, a civil penalty. If you didn't take a training, that was a penalty. If you, um, what else did the, if so, so many incomplete applications, that was a criminal fine. Um, if you, um, if you didn't turn your voter register, the forms in within 10 days, that was a criminal fine. And so we, they were putting all these criminal sanctions on voter registration efforts. And they were considering an incomplete registration. Uh, the birthday night on it. Okay. Or is it common for you not to want to put your social security number on a, a sheet of paper and give it to somebody you don't know? Or to Some, check Mr. Ms. or Mrs. Yes. If you skip that box, yes. it was incomplete. Absolutely. It was just ridiculous. Um, and so we were oftentimes telling, you know, the, the Secretary of State, the individuals, our legislators who were pushing this particular bill, it's unconstitutional. It's, you know, it comes from, you know, uh, malicious intent. Don't pass this bill. And they passed it anyway with the understanding that this is, is because of these, this particular group of people were voting in numbers. And now you have, and I mean, I'm not, and it wasn't just African-American organizations lobbying against this bill. I mean, we had the League of Women Voters, who's a nonpartisan group, you know, other civil rights organizations. I mean, everyone's saying, this is a bad bill. And now it passed. And the governor signed it, passed both houses, and the governor signed it. And I think about in 2019, and I'm sitting here as an African-American woman, and all my colleagues around me go vote yes on a bill that's trying to criminalize my ability to t be engaged in the political process. And not only was it hurtful to all the African-Americans across the state of Tennessee, but I felt a particular way sitting there as a black woman, and I wanted to cry when they passed that. I did everything I could to speak out against this bill, talk about this bill, but we understand that racism is still very real and it's still very systematic. And the current state of this bill is a federal judge just last week, um, the state of Tennessee tried to block the civil rights uh, lawsuit against the state for this bill. And the state tries to, you know, say, you know, don't let these organizations block my bill. And the federal judge um, made a stance against the state saying, your bill is particularly unconstitutional. Why would you, yes. 
The judge stated, why are we placing criminal penalties on civic engagement groups uh, uh, want to get more people involved in the political process? Why are we placing criminal sanctions when you never put in any form of training in the first place? What are we doing? And so thank God for judges. Um, but, <laughs> thank God. But, you know, th th I'm saying that all to say is that the, the fight to continue to ensure that every demographic of people has the right to vote is still ongoing, even hundreds of years later. Um, and it's not even just you know, African-Americans, young people too. I've, um, last year, I started working on a bill with the American Democracy Project here at MTSU that would put voting um, locations on college campuses. Why not make college campuses voting locations? And you would think this would be something simple. Our institutions of higher learning should be the perfect place for young people to be engaged in the civic process where we are learning how to be stewards of our community, where we are learning how, to, how we're going to influence the next generation of people. Yet you should be surprised how much pushback we got from those who run our elections about giving young people the right to vote. And we're the largest generation of eligible voters in the country, period. And so you wonder why so many young people are fatigued with the political process is because we make it so hard for you to engage in a process in the first place. It is ridiculous. So with that being said, you know, I understand that African Americans have been fighting for over four or five hundred years in order for equality and the fight is still ongoing. Women, our, our right to be involved in, in, in the political process 100 years later is ongoing. So my message to the young people in this office is being able to advance our political agenda is not as quick as sending out a tweet, a Facebook post, or Instagram post. It is continuously ongoing, and it's our civic obligation to be involved in that process. And we have an obligation to give back to the next generation like the women and the men and the people who came before us are able to create a path for us to be successful today. And so, although you are fatigued with the political process, don't give up. Yes, your one vote can't change the whole demographic of the political process, but your vote in mass together can really change the outlook of this world. And we will not be the change that we want to see and we do not engage in voting in the political process and we do not help continue to elect the people we want to see change the way our world works. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I want to close but, because we want to leave some time for uh, questions, but I want to just pose to each of you this same question. Why do women today need to know what happened leading up to 1920? Why do they need to know? <laughs> okay. Why do they need to know this story? Why do we need to know and understand this legacy? Well, I think in, in order to get charged up, like you, you know, like my colleague here, and to, to understand um, that we once were denied, that there are people who would still deny that universal suffrage is um, super important and that our, our whole democracy depends on it. Uh, you know, I think that they need to know the history in order to, to get the fire in the belly and, and and to a sense of the injustices and a sense of what working hard persistently for change can accomplish. But it's not linear. And, and rights gained are not guaranteed. And I think that um, you know, one of the most important things um, to, to pick up between what I was saying a minute ago and then what you just said was that you know, after the suffrage, after the victory for the 19th Amendment, which gave, by the way, it did give black women, as well as white women, the vote. So don't let people tell you that the 19th Amendment did not give African American women right. the right to vote. It did, and it should be celebrated for that, for enfranchising all women who were citizens. But what happened after that, of course, is that the states then in the southern states, they denied it. African-American women were voting in the North. Uh, they had been voting in some states 
like Illinois, long before 1920. Um, so it's, you know, it isn't a case where it did not enfranchise any African American women. But the point is that in the South, because the states took the action that they did to suppress the vote, that it took another suffrage movement known as the Civil Rights Movement right. in order to get full enfranchisement in this country and the universal suffrage that the suffragists had been hoping for black and white from the Civil War onward. And so um, we feel that, I, I used to teach my classes or give lectures on suffrage and wrap it up saying, so finally in 1965, we gained full suffrage and universal suffrage in the country, yes, hooray. And we did for a little while. <laughs> but then Shelby, Shelby versus Holder comes along and, uh, and the Supreme Court says, oh, okay, we had a black president, Miss, everything's cool now. We don't need this, we don't need to be monitoring these states that are taking these votes away anymore. So they you know, made that decision, they called off the, um, the watch, and we've seen what's happened. And, and uh, so, in, so here we are again. Um, we're seeing, particularly in the southern states, though not exclusively, and particularly aimed at people of color, these efforts at voter suppression, which means, of course, we need to involve all of you and all of us in a, in a new suffrage movement. Absolutely. Because that's what's, what's going to take to save our democracy. Same question for you, Representative Lamar. Why do we need to know the past today? If you don't know where you came from, you won't know where you need to go. And I think that if we, thank you, if we don't, if we don't, aren't educated on where we used to be in the past, um, you know, what worked, what, what were some of the things that we did in order to be, to be where we are, we don't know where we need to continue to go. So if I'm not educated on what my ancestor did, what the women pushed for in order to achieve the right to vote, how I'm going to advocate today? How do I know, you know, what particular laws are continuing to disenfranchise my ability to right to vote? How do I understand that young people still are disenfranchised when it comes to the right to vote? How do I understand that African Americans are still being discriminated upon even in the 21st century. And so I think that oftentimes we don't articulate our past and which is why we are not, we don't have a true strategy right now on how we're gonna move forward as a country. Everybody is, has their own circles and we're not working together, which is why my particular party sometimes can't get it together. You know, because we're not looking at, you know, what what we already accomplished and we're just we have everybody has their own agenda but i think that what i admire about the the women's suffrage movement and then you know the civil rights movement is that everybody was on the same page everybody had one agenda and we were able to move forward together and i think that if we really go back and look at our past i think that we can be able to make sure that we have a better future i'm hopeful i am so thankful for the women who marched and, 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 and rallied and picketed and, and done everything that they did because I wouldn't be sitting here today if it wasn't for those women and I honor them. Um, but I understand that even though in my capacity sitting here, they, we still got much further to go. And so, you know, my students here at MTSU, the state capitol is just 45 minutes down the highway <laughs> next year. If they come with any voter suppression bills, I need your help. Because just like Susan B. Anthony and Ida B. Wells and, and, and Sojourner Truth needed other women to stand with them, I need you to stand with me. And I just really appreciate the opportunity to, to, to be here. Right. Let's open the dialogue. Um, we have two mics at the ends of the aisles and we invite you to come up and line up and ask these ladies questions. Please do. You've got the questions. Let's hear them. There they are. It's a big crowd. I learned some stuff. I have a question, and I'll start. Representative Lamar said um, no single 
vote has an impact, but in the state of Tennessee, one vote actually changed the course of women's history. True, <laughs> right, right. Can you give the, the two minute version of that, Dr. Spruill? Oh yeah, you mean the Harry Byrne story? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I love the Harry Byrne story. Um, yeah, I mean, we, uh, Tennessee ends up being the, the final battles, battleground. Um, and Woodrow Wilson asked uh, Governor Albert Roberts to call a special session, and so he does, but it's gonna be a little while out. Carrie Chapman Catt, the president of the National American Woman Suffrage Association says, hey, Tennessee suffragists who are working hard, getting ready for this, you take a poll of every member of the legislature and you mark it. Are you committed to support the suffrage bill or oppose ratification? And so they did. They polled them carefully. They had their list. And Carrie Chapman Catt also said, you watch it because over the summer, there are gonna be a lot of people in that yes column falling off. Mm -hmm. and, and the Tennessee suffragists watched one by one as, as that happened. Not the least, um, Seth Walker, who was the, the um, what do you call it, speaker of the legislature, who had asked them for the honor and privilege of being the one to push through the, suffrage, the ratification campaign. But guess what, all of a sudden he changed his mind. So this, they had a really hard job. Uh, they felt like that the liquor industry and the cotton textile industry and the l and Railroad and others were bribing the legislators. And mean, meanwhile, if they, you know, they were beginning to accuse um, the suffragists of, of bribing legislatures, but of course they weren't. Uh, so what happens is, in the end, is it comes down to, to this, looks like it's gonna be a tie, and um, they call the vote, and there's Harry Byrne, 24-year-old Republican from the mountains. He's wearing a red rose, a sign that he's with the anti-suffragists. And as I hear it, the story, he stands up and he rips off that rose and he says, I, you know. And the reason, because in his pocket, he has this letter from his mommy. <laughs> <laughs> Feb Ensminger Byrne, who had written the letter, they have the letter. Uh, his his uh, descendant, Tyler Boyd, is Tyler here anywhere? Has uh, just published a book about Harry Byrne, his ancestor. Um, anyway, it's a, it's a great story. And after that, I mean, these people were all over him. They chased him out of the building. He had to climb through and get out of a ledge. He was accused of being bribed. And not only that, but the wife of the governor of Louisiana, who was a firmly opposed to ratification, went up to the mountains and was bugging his mother and saying, <laughs> I want you to tell him to, to call this off. It's an amazing story. Um, but in the end, what happens is, when you, women were trying to get the vote, you know, you, you're trying to get direct influence, the power to represent your own self, but you had to get it through indirect influence mm -hmm. because the men were the ones that had the power. And so good for Feb, as far as I'm concerned. That's a great Boys story. Boys love their mamas, yeah. huh? No. <laughs> By one vote. Yeah. Sir. Hello, I have a question uh, for Representative Lamar. Um, as a representative, you talked about a criticism, um, especially in your political uh, dealings. How do you deal with the negative flow of, um, of commentary throughout your career? That's a good question. Um, you know, I, I understood going before I, I entered politics, just being in the field and helping other people's campaigns that people are going to talk about you. And I live life understanding that I'm not perfect, I'm flawed, you know? And so what I do is I make sure I keep a good grounded support system around me. My family is very supportive of me. I make sure my team um, is very supportive of me and, and ensures that I have everything I need. Um, but I oftentimes, sometimes listen to the criticisms too. I, you know, I'm oftentimes, um, speak about Af issues facing African American community, and I get tweets. You're a racist, or you're this, you're that, whatever. Um, and I and I look at why, and I try to understand what their perspective is. 
um, and, and try to rationalize why they're so hateful. But you know, it's just part of the process. And, it, and I won't say that sometimes it doesn't hurt or sometimes it's not annoying. But I understood when I decided to um, give, dedicate my life to politics that that was something that was gonna come with it. And I understand that I'm not always gonna make people happy, and I'm okay with that. But I have an obligation to speak about my community, the needs of my community, and ensure that the rest of my colleagues understand that they have an obligation to help my community, whether you like it or not. Is there a question on this side? Representative Lamar, I'm speaking to you as a fellow Memphian. So I'm happy to see you. And I would just like to add an additional response to the question, why do we need to know about this? When young people ask me or say to me, my one vote doesn't matter, I frame it for them by saying, did your ancestor oppress anyone? Or was your ancestor oppressed? And if the answer is yes, then this is our chance to stand now either against the oppressor that was my ancestor or against the person who was oppressed that was my ancestor. That's right. And I personalize it to say, I can stand now for those who went before me who couldn't. And that's my comment. Uh, that's a great point. I, and I really value that. I, one of the biggest influences in my life is my grandmother. My grandmother is 84 years old, and she vividly remembers when she did not have the right to vote because of the different forms of segregation in Memphis, Tennessee, where the poll taxes, they were turned away at the polls. And every time, and, I, and, I, and I'm very close to her, so when I see her every day, it reminds me, how dare I not speak up for you and everything you did for me to put me here and everything that you went through and your mama went through and all of my family members, my ancestors. And that is why, you know, I do what I do. And I think that's a great reason why, you know, I think it's important that we know our histories because if we don't honor those who came before us, who did the work to, so that we could get here, how can we move forward? And I definitely appreciate your comment. You know, my grandmother is the reason why I'm in politics now. Um, she is just amazing. She marched with Dr. King and everything like that. So I was just like really excited. And I remember the day she went to, to the polls to vote for me and I cried because I was like, wow, I remember the day, you know, you remember a day when you couldn't even walk into the polls. Now you walking into the polls to vote for your grandbaby. So yeah, <laughs> it's great. <laughs> Okay, cool. Um, I was just wondering if you could expound upon the uh, court case post-2008 that you mentioned, um, trying to suppress voter rights again, because I had never heard of that. So if you could expound upon that, that'd be cool, so I can know. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, it was, uh, you know, it was, there'd been a number of changes in the constitution of, of the court, and uh, this is Robert's court, and it was a hugely controversial case. It was closely watched through the country. And, uh, you know, most people understood that there were still efforts to suppress the vote. But the, the court decided that, um, that um, it wasn't necessary. And Congress, after that, you know, could pass new voting rights legislation that would um, you know, do similar things to what the Voting Rights Act of 65 had done. I mean, basically what that did was to uh, use federal power to enforce the 15th and the 19th Amendments. And, uh, but that hasn't happened. I mean, it's been a, an issue that, that's, that, it's a very vital issue in our world today. Um, and I'm still hoping that Congress will act on that. Um, I'm not expecting the Supreme Court to help out much on this issue, frankly, anytime soon. But uh, Congress can, can act. Uh, and so, but, but while waiting for them to do anything about enforcing uh, these, these amendments, it, it means that 
massive voter registration efforts have to be made uh, because you're, if, if there are people who are actively out there trying to suppress the vote, that means you've got to vote 10 times as much because they're going to strike some of it out or, or deny some people. The, right? So it's, it, it makes the, the job even harder, right. but it makes it even more important. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Um, this is directed at you, Representative Lamar. Um, what can students who want to be involved on campus and in politics in general, I know that you have helped with the authorization of a bill um, that I find personally significant. Um, what can we do to our local representatives? What can we do to make sure that we help along with the passage of that bill? I know that it has to get through committee, it has to be put on the docket. What right. can we do to make sure that we have people that stand with you? Thank you so much for asking that question. That's a very, very important question. First, I wanna go back to you know what I said earlier about how I got involved in politics. Start on your college campus. What particular things do you want to see change in your campus? Get involved in your SGAs, your student clubs, um, have conversations with your college administrators about making sure this community, your own campus community, is conducive to how you, how you want to see it. Part of that is saying we want voting on campus because oftentimes if the students are in uproar about the fact that they want voting on campus, I'm going to have the support from your college president when I'm advocating to the Secretary of State and um, the other legislators about getting this bill passed. Secondly is making sure that you're registered to vote. And I saw that you had voter registration um, tables set up all through campus, so big that's ups to you impressive. for that. Like, I think that's amazing. Um, make sure you vote, even though voting is not taking place on campus right now. Um, one of your representatives, um, well, one of your representatives I know is on board with Representative Charlie Baum. Hey, Charlie, he's <laughs> over there right now. Um, he's committed to you know helping me make sure we can get on the same page. But the other representative for the Rutherford area is Representative Rudd, who was here earlier. He is the chairman of the election subcommittee. He has influence over most of the election bills that come through the legislature. I need you to write, tweet, Facebook, come to the Capitol, annoy him so much, and say, when we put this bill on the docket in January, I need you to help get this passed, and I need your vote for it. He's, he was also the uh, sponsor of the voter suppression bill I was talking about. So I need, it's oftentimes he needs to hear from you, the community he represents, that this is something that you want to see. And so also, I need you to then call all the legislators, tweet, Facebook, email, whatever, show up 45 minutes down the road and come to the committee hearings. Talk to the legislators who vote on this. And so the more students we have advocating for this bill, the greater of a chance it has to pass. And so again, you know, I, social media helps because they need to see that, but most importantly, I need you to be able to show up. And, and, and call your friends at the other college campuses around the state. This is not just for MTSU, this is for students across the state of Tennessee at our public colleges and universities. I think that it is so important that you have the ability to take part in the political process here on campus. You spend most of your time on campus anyway. And so, you know, this is something that, you know, again, is not as simple as sending out a tweet, even though I need you to do that as well, but it also is, it takes a little bit more effort requiring us to show up. And again, I will be continue to communicate with the American Democracy Project here on campus about how we're moving forward with the bill. And so please communicate with them starting in January about specific dates that will be on schedule. When you can show up, you're welcome to call my office at any time. And you're also able to hit me on Twitter and Instagram at London Lamar TN and let me know, you know, if you have volunteers who want to show up or you need more information, I got you. So those are some of the things that you can do right now to help make sure this bill can pass. That's great. We have a young man right here and then let's call it quits. Sir. All right, uh, Representative Lamar, this is a question for you. Sure. Concerning, you know, information and staying up to date on current information on any sort of legislation that might be passed, you know, specifically voter suppression or whatnot. Is there any like sort of sites or ways we can stay as up to date as possible and get the most clear information? So 
that is something I'm, I try to do my best on an individual level with my social media and try to communicate some of those particular legislation that I felt like the public needs to know about. But you can always go to the state of Tennessee website and track all the bills that are coming through. But I will say that is very complicated. If you literally don't know what you're reading or how to use it, I, would, I wouldn't use it as well because it's really hard to decipher. There isn't really a simplified path platform um, that you know lays out what particular legislation is coming through. You you know, oftentimes I even myself make it hard. I try to keep up with the news. I have an assistant that you know lays out what's coming this week. But unfortunately, that's something I need a young person who is tech savvy, who is interested in <laughs> politics, to come up with a media platform we can use that can lay out what particular legislation is coming through in a simplified way. But as of right now, you can go to capital.tn.gov, look at every piece of legislation that's filed. It's just time consuming, that's all. Could I add, just uh, as a representative of the media here, there, there are some absolutely wonderful reporters uh, covering the State House. And if you follow WPLN, the National Public Radio affiliate in, in uh, Nashville, if you go and sign up for their daily newsletter, they have two, only two or three stories that, they, that come through their newsletter every single day. That, those two or three stories, while the legislature in, is in session, almost exclusively concern laws that are being introduced, that are being discussed. If you follow some of the Nashville Scenes reporters, if you follow some of the Tennesseans reporters, they have people covering the State House dawn to midnight. They are there. If the legislature is there, they are there. If you follow them on Twitter, they will post links to, to explanations that are very unlike the uh, actual bills right. that are written in human language. And you can, um, you can really stay immensely so informed without having to be in the State House yourself if you follow the journalists who are covering the State House. I want to remind everybody that um, Dr. Spruill and Ms. Wrinkle's books are on sale. I don't think Representative Lamar has a book quite yet, but I bet she will shortly. <laughs> um, and well, it was, if um, you're interested in buying a book, um, recently um, I was in a book featured in the New York Times called See Jane Wynn. They just came out last week, and it's covering four women, myself and three other women, who decided to run for office, mm -hmm. and it's on sale now, Amazon and, Bar and Barnes and Noble, so check it out. All right, sorry, we didn't know that. We would have, we would have had it here today. <laughs> I love that title. <laughs> so uh, they will be happy to sign. Please come down. Uh, you're invited to visit with them and um, to go through the book signing tables. Everybody needs to get registered to vote. Please also remember to vote. Our next opportunity is Super Tuesday, which is March 3rd. Take on an issue, commit to it, learn something, care, uh, have an impact, be counted as part of the census. And everybody, please be a suffragist for voting, citizenship, and engagement. Your voting and your engagement count, and they are what will dismantle power structures that keep people from realizing their full potential in this country. Be the change. Thank you so much for being here, and see you next year, September 17th.